Japanese media reports say Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba may fly here into Seoul next month for talks with President Yoon Seok-yeol as they look to usher in 60 years of diplomatic relations next year. On Press Perspective today, we delve into the future course of bilateral ties amid persistent geopolitical uncertainty. Hello and welcome to Press Perspective. It's Monday, December 2nd here in South Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today we touch upon prospects of productive partnership between Seoul and Tokyo amid heightened tensions over Pyongyang's hostile intentions and uncertainty over Washington's policy transition under a new leadership. For more on this, I have Fabian Kreshma, a correspondent for German press agency based here in Seoul. Welcome to the program, Fabian. Hello. I also have Walter Sim, a correspondent for the Straits Times, based in Tokyo. Walter, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Right, Walter, let's start with Japanese media reports about a possible visit to South Korea by Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba next month. What has been shared about the purpose of this visit, and do you believe this visit is likely? Well, I think the view out of Japan is that this trip is going to be part of the shuttle diplomacy of regular mutual visits that had been agreed by Mr. Ishiba's predecessor, Fumio Kishida, with President Yoon suk yeol And evidently, I think Mr. Ishiba sees this relationship with South Korea as important, given that well, Mr. Ishiba only took office on October the 1st, and he has already met Mr. Yoon twice on the sidelines of international conferences. So in, in that regard, I do think that the trip in January is likely to take place, um, so long as there is political and diplomatic will on both sides. And this is up, uh, and I think Japan has the political will to have this, uh, to have the trip happen, given that 2025 is going to be a pivotal milestone year. As you said, both countries are going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the normalization of their relations. And so I think Japan does recognize the need to start 2025 on the right footing and to send a strong message of the strength of bilateral relations, especially when there is a lot of turmoil in the world. And uh, interestingly, Mr. Ishiba himself did say uh, in his policy speech to the Diet last Friday that, you know, the two countries, he was looking forward for the two countries to host regular meetings at all levels frequently so that 2025 will be a year, and I quote, uh, a year in which there will be a giant leap forward in bilateral ties. Right. Staying with that, Fabian, if this visit does take place, then it will mark Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba's first overseas trip for a bilateral diplomatic agenda. Now, he has been abroad for a number of multilateral meetings. What are your thoughts on the significance of this planned event? Yeah, I mean, if it takes place, it really is remarkable because the first um, foreign trip of a head of state um, that is selected very carefully. For example, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, he selected France to be his first uh, destination. Or for a Chinese head of state, traditionally it's Russia where uh, he will go first. So if um, uh, Ishiba goes to Seoul, then um, it basically shows First, that he places a lot of importance on the um, bilateral relationship between, uh, talk, uh, between South Korea and Japan, and that he wants to improve uh, the relationship. And I think, as Walter mentioned, it is really a historic year, 60 years after uh, diplomatic ties uh, have been normalized. So I think that also plays into it. Right, of course. Walter, what issues are the South Korean and Japanese leaders likely to address during a summit if it does take place? Well, firstly, I, I think there is going to be a lot to discuss, especially given how 2025 looks set to be a very uncertain year geopolitically. Both countries will surely want to coordinate their positions and approach to diplomacy, especially in the era of the incoming Trump administration. So I guess they would probably want to talk about potential areas where they could further cooperation in security or in trade, as well as to manage North Korea-related issues. Um, but I think um, the elephant in the room that is history might be unavoidable as well, especially after South Korea made its displeasure shown after boycotting the first memorial event held on Sado Island uh, to commemorate wartime labor, labor who worked on the gold and silver mine complex there. So I, I think um, there's a lot of work 
still to be done so that both countries, both leaders can ensure that they can have forward looking relations despite their not so well, not so happy past. Right, and speaking of forward looking relations, Fabian, do you believe the incoming US administration and its America first policy will perhaps serve to push Seoul and Tokyo closer? Hypothetically, yes. Of course, it's not a given, but it could be. Let me give you some context. Um, traditionally, the US presidents, they had a strong interest that uh, Japan and South Korea get along well. Both are US allies. And you know what prevented uh, the improvement of, of relationship was historic disputes. I'm sure we get to that later. And um, but in the last years, Japan and South Korea actually have been getting closer already. Uh, Yoon Seok Yeol uh, proposed this friendship towards Japan. And I think um, there are two factors that accelerated this development. First, the growing threat by North Korea. And I would say also the growing challenge posed by China. I think that also gave an incentive to, for the two countries to um, get closer and cooperate um, stronger. Now, when Trump gets into office, he's very against um, multilateral relationships. He wants to deal on a, on a country to country level. He's uh, not so much the biggest fan of uh, NATO, of, of uh, multilateral institutions. He also made some comments regarding the security situation here that, for example, South Korea should pay more money, etc. All those things basically give Japan and South Korea a stronger incentive to also cooperate closer with each other. Right. Walter, so despite advances in diplomacy in recent times, conflict over history, as you mentioned earlier, persists between Seoul and Tokyo. Now, last week, there was much media coverage about separate ceremonies by South Korea and Japan in memory of the forced laborers of the Sado mines that you mentioned earlier. First of all, for the sake of our viewers who may not be too familiar with this, do tell us a bit about the Sado mines and the conflict behind them. Sure. Um, so the Sado mines, as introduced earlier, they they were in operation for nearly 400 years, starting from 1601, and it had actually once been the world's largest gold producer. But the mines shut in 1989, and, and so now the mines on Sado, which is an island off the coast of Niigata in Japan, it, uh, the, mine, the former mines now host the tourism facility and the hiking site. So Japan wanted to put the Sado mines up for listing on the UNESCO World Heritage Site because, as I mentioned, it was once the producer of 20% of the world's gold. And it also was home to what was once regarded as state-of-the-art production process. So from mining to dressing, smelting, refining, and even the production and minting of coins, they were all produced and done on the island. But of course, as, as you said, there has been a lot of controversy and South Korea has been a staunch opponent to the leasing of these mines on UNESCO, although it dropped uh, its opposition in July and decided to support the listing after consultations with uh, Tokyo and after Tokyo pledged and promised to improve the exhibitions of the historical background of and the involvement of Korean laborers at the site. And it also promised to hold an annual memorial that would also commemorate the contributions of Korean laborers at the site. Um, but of course there were caveats. For one, Japan did not apologize for wartime laborers uh, uh, on the uh, Korean wartime laborers, uh, it, Japan did not offer another apology on that. Uh, neither did Japan recognize that the laborers from the Korean Peninsula at the Sado mines were coerced. So I think, uh, as we discussed the memorial last week, um, South Korea did boycott the the event because. And, and because it said that the content of the event did not meet its, ex its expectations, um, there has been nothing out there about why South Korea, the specifics as to why South Korea decided to boycott the event, but I kind of suspect it's because of perhaps displeasure over Japan's reluctance to call, uh, to recognize that the Korean wartime laborers on at the mines were coerced. So interestingly, there was also a bit of controversy over how Japan was represented at the, mom, at the memorial by its parliamentary vice foreign minister, Akiko Ikuina. Uh, she was once reported by Japan's Kyoto News to have once visited the war linked Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. And Yasukuni is controversial mainly because it enshrines 14 class A war criminals. But that report turned out to be false. And, um, and, but 
even then, South Korea did say that it would still not have attended the event, even if it had known that the report was false. So interestingly, uh, Ms. Ikuina also said at the event that um, whilst she paid respects to the labourers, she said, and I quote, the labourers who came from the Korean Peninsula took on a difficult work in a dangerous and harsh environment, but she did not say that they were coerced, and that still remains Japan's line. Right. There has been a growing call among activists here for Japan to understand, to admit that the workers there had been forced to work at the Sado Mines. After boycotting, of course, the memorial by Japan on Sunday, Korea held its own memorial on Monday, I believe, for the forced laborers of the Sado Mines. Uh, Fabian, a Japanese scholar on the country's wartime history told AP News, and I quote, the conflict surrounding the Sado Mines underscores a deeper problem of Japan's failure to face up to its wartime responsibility and its growing denialism of its wartime atrocities. Now, these are the remarks of a Japanese scholar speaking to AP News. What are your thoughts regarding this remark? Yeah, I have a lot to add on that. Um, I mean, the truth is always neither black or white. There are a lot of grayish uh, tones to it. But in general, yes, the, the, the scholar that you quoted, I agree with this statement. I mean, um, what we've been seeing is that uh, Japan did maybe two steps forward, but then one step back again. I mean, we've seen there has been some goodwill, there has been uh, negotiations with the South Korean side, there's been some compromise, but then again, there was no formal apology. There was, it was everything very half-heartedly. So I, I do understand the anger of, let's say, the South Korean civil society, of, also of the broader population. And um, sometimes you also have to see that, I mean, there's, there was a collective trauma that still lives on in South Korea. And, uh, a trauma um, sometimes uh, is very emotional. It, it, it triggers some emotions that, um, you know, cannot be always explained only in a rational way. I think there has to be sometimes um, one side who really gives in more. And I think in, in this regard, the Japanese side should formally apologize um, and uh, should not do it so half-heartedly. And then secondly, there's also another dimension. Domestically, um, what prevents the improvement of relationship between Japan and South Korea is also that uh, within South Korea, the opposition of the government always can, you know, exploit any remark that can be considered as being pro-Japan as for, for domestic gains and can be heavily criticized. So I, I think that's why also South Korean leaders are very careful and very cautious not to trigger any anger among their own population. I think that also plays a little bit into it. Fabio, we have a little bit more time left, which is why I'm going to ask you this impromptu question. Some pundits here in the country have often compared uh, Germans' apology to its neighbours with regard to its wartime atrocities to that of Japan. What are your thoughts regarding this? Yeah, I mean, uh, within Korean media, I often get this question. Um, and yeah, to some degree, I would say uh, Germany, but it, it took actually one generation, um, basically the generation of my parents, they were fighting very hard uh, to, to deal about those questions, to demand apologies, to, to uh, have an open debate about that. The, the immediately after war generation was actually very reluctant to talk about that. But I think, that, yeah, there has been um, very much progress, but I think Germany is also not the perfect role model for it. So in, in my opinion, I think you should not use another country example example to, to point a finger or so. I think th there are many cultural uniqueness also to, to um, the case that in East Asia I would say it's also more difficult to um, acknowledge the mistakes of your grandparents generation for example. But having said that, yes in general I would say that um, at least to some degree uh, Japan could maybe take a little bit of an example of Germany of yeah, acknowledging more the own dark past. It, it doesn't mean that you neglect everything, but I think it, you cannot have any progress in the future if you don't um, acknowledge that within your past you did uh, horrible uh, wrong things. Yeah. Right. Walter, meanwhile, speaking of scholars, but moving on to another issue of bilateral interest between Seoul and Tokyo, another Japanese pundit recently shared prospects of the incoming Trump administration accepting North Korea as a nuclear state. What are your thoughts regarding the likelihood of such a reality? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because nobody really knows what's going on in President-elect Donald Trump's mind, let alone how he will intend to deal with Kim Jong-un. Um, so would, there, would he want to try for another Trump-Kim summit or is 
Kim Jong-un now so far in Russia's embrace that he is going to shut the door on any outreach by the United States. But that said, I suppose the odds of the incoming Trump administration accepting North Korea as a nuclear state, um, the chances are definitely not zero, especially if Trump, given how transactional he is known to be, especially if it could serve as a sort of negotiation tactic to bring North Korea to the negotiation table or to even bring North Korea under uh, nuclear arms control, such as under the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. But of course, it is within the interest of uh, countries like Japan and South Korea uh, to dissuade Trump from doing so if, if diplomats even get a whiff that you know it's going to be a, a possible idea in his mind. Right. Fabio, what do you suppose would be the broader implications of recognizing North Korea as a nuclear power? They would be rather negative. I mean, I'm very torn in between uh, in this question because on the one hand, yeah, North Korea is de facto a nuclear state and there's really not much what the international community can do about it. So basically it's just dealing with reality and saying how things are. But on the other hand, if you formally recognize uh, North Korea as a nuclear state, that is, would be a huge victory for North Korea. And it would basically, um, yeah, um, give incentives for other states to follow that way, uh, the same route, because they see, okay, North Korea got away with it. They just, you know, waited patiently. They endured some hardship, some sanctions, but in the end, um, they were recognized uh, as a nuclear state. Then I'm sure there's some other authoritarian states will also th think, okay, maybe that could be an option for us. And that is very dangerous. We need less countries in this world who have nuclear weapons and not more. Right. And should North Korea be allowed to have nuclear weapons, Walter? The concern is that there would be scholars here, and there currently are scholars who believe that South Korea should also be able to develop its own nuclear weapons. What do you suppose would be the implications of that for this region, Walter? Well, given how close Japan and South Korea are, I don't think Japan would be that opposed to South Korea developing nuclear weapons, especially if it's to be used for its own security. But of course, I, th there's a very grave danger that would that it would ac accelerate the arms race in Northeast Asia. Uh, we we'll, you would see North Korea and South Korea wanting to one up each other in terms of the technology that it has, and I don't think it bodes well at all. And and on that note, interestingly, there has also been talk by a segment of Japanese policymakers and scholars that maybe just maybe Japan should also consider. Uh, in some form of or another hosting U.S. nuclear weapons within the, the country. And, and of course, that is with more, more with Taiwan, the, the Taiwan issue in mind. But uh, interestingly, despite its dark past, despite being the only country in the world to suffer an atomic bombing, despite the Nobel Peace Prize winners this year going to a non-profit group of atomic bomb survivors, there is still a small segment of the population who are discussing that. And, and so I, I think it's really an issue of grave concern. Right. And I wonder, Fabian, do you suppose leaders over in Europe would be understanding of having two countries, if South Korea does pursue to have nuclear weapons, of having both South Korea and North Korea possess nuclear weapons? How do you suppose leaders in, the Euro in Europe would respond to that? Well, I'm sometimes having conversations also on that topic with uh, diplomats here, and the answer is uh, very clear. I mean, they would not support it because, um, I mean, there is uh, a lot of efforts to get rid of nuclear weapons. And even though, of course, it's a complicated situation that South Korea in, I think um, Europe would be very uh, cautious in, uh, you know, allowing this. I mean, uh, of course, um, that's the autonomous decision of South Korea, but I think there would be some consequences because it's really not in Europe's interest to have another country uh, to possess um, nuclear weapons. And I think Europe's position would rather be that um, the nuclear umbrella of the U.S. Um, should be credible and we should work towards um, uh, having alliances and not um, having more countries pursue to have nu nuclear weapons. All right. And speaking about Europe, Fabien, what are the chances of Mr. Trump um, moving the U.S. out of the NATO alliance once he returns to the White House next month, do you think? Okay, w with Trump in general, I think it's really also a problem of the media how to cover Trump because what he says is so outrageous. It's sometimes uh, very uh, erratic. And um, in the end, you know, he's, um, you know, this proverb, we use it in Germany a lot, like some dogs, they're barking a lot, but in the end, they don't bite. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean is that, you know, at least from Trump's first presidency, I think he 
also did a lot of uh, outrageous things, but in the end it was not as bad as many people expected. And I think, especially for NATO, I think in the end it will not, I mean, he will not um, uh, pursue all the things that he said during the campaign. I don't think he will get out of NATO. Right, there are pundits here in the country, Fabian, who are also hoping that Mr. Trump's bark is worse than his bite then. All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Fabian, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Walter, over in Tokyo, thank you so much for your insights. Right, well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching and see you same time tomorrow.